Welcome to our morning service at Bamford Chapel and Northern United Reformed Church, Rochdale. Our church is part of the Rochdale, Bury and North Manchester Churches Missional Partnership. We are meeting again in church, but continue to do a visual recording which goes out on our church website and YouTube. My name is David Watson and I am an el a serving elder of the United Reformed Church. Our call to worship. Generous God, thank you for being with us today. In this coming week, help us to remember what we hear, say and sing. Remind us daily that we need to share our love for you with others. Be with each one of us and all those we love in our service this morning, throughout this week and always. Amen. We can sing all of our hymns this morning, so let us lift our praise to God as we sing our first hymn, I Want to Walk with Jesus Christ. to our prayers. Let us pray. Lord, we praise you, our mighty Creator. Every time we witness the magnificence of all that you have made, we are moved to praise you. Every mountain and hill, every field and every valley, every tree and every plant, every creature small and large, every colour, shape and design moves us to offer you our worship and our praise. We praise you for every person we meet, every conversation we share, for every laugh and smile, every tear that is wiped away and every hurt that is shared. We praise you for every experience of true friendship and every discovery of what it means to be human and what it means to be ourselves. We praise you for the gift of life and for our new life in Christ. We praise you for the life of your church and the deep fellowship that is ours in him. For every experience that draws us closer together as he breaks down the walls of distrust and the barriers of prejudice that we build. We praise you for the assurance that the love, joy, worship and fellowship we share now are only a sample of all that you have in store for us in the heaven of your love. 
We praise you for our oneness in Christ and ask that our love for each other may be a channel of your peace for others. And we confess. Father, we come with our emptiness and our times of defeat. We come with our excuses, with our readiness to blame anyone but ourselves. We come to you acknowledging who and what we are. We come to confess that you are the one who can make us whole. We come to you because we have nowhere else and no one else to come to. Father, we have come to praise you for inviting us to come. We ask this and pray this in the name of Jesus, the one through whom we offer all our praises and our prayers. Amen. And we share together in the Lord's Prayer, beginning, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And now a little story for the children. One day a group was thinking of redecorating their church, and they were asked to think of a colour that reminded them of God so that a stained glass window could be made. One of them said that the window should be clear, because that reminded them of the Spirit of God. Through the clear window we would see people and creation, and be reminded that God's Spirit is at work in people and in the world. God's Spirit is also transparent, like the wind, and blows where it will. Someone else suggested yellow for light, because Jesus is the light of the world, and when the sun shone, it would cast a yellow glow of light around the room. Someone else suggested blue, because it reminded them of the power of the sea, the sky and the creative power of God. They each debated the merits of their suggestions, but when the artist turned around and showed them her sketch, the window had clear patches and blue and yellow patches. But where the three colours overlapped, there was the most amazing emerald green. The window was duly made and the three colours used, but the centre of the window was the most beautiful part of all. We each have our own vision of God, but when we put them together, when we look at God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, then our understanding of God is far more beautiful than could ever be imagined. We sing our next hymn, God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you. Live. 
If we come to church, we may place our offerings on the plate at the back as we come in or go out, or we may give regularly through our banks. However we give, we ask God to bless our gifts as we pray. Lord, all that we have comes from you, our time and our talents and our treasure, and we thank you for all that you bless us with each day of our lives. We bring our gifts to you as a token of our appreciation for all that we have received from you and we bring ourselves. Bless the gifts and bless us and use the gifts and us to further the advancement of your kingdom in this place and elsewhere. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray for this. Amen. Our next hymn is The Spirit Lives to Set Us Free. The Spirit lives to set us free. Walk, walk in the light. He binds us all in unity. Walk, walk in the light. Walk in the light. Walk in the light. Walk in the light. Walk in the light of the Lord. Jesus promised life to all. Walk, walk in the light, the dead were wakened by his call. Walk, walk in the light, walk in the light, walk in the light, walk in the light, walk in the light of the Lord. He died in pain on Calvary. Walk, walk in the light to save the like you and me. Walk, walk in the light. Walk in the light. Walk in the light. Walk in the light. Walk in the light of the Lord. We know his death was not the end. Walk, walk in the light. He gave his spirit to be our friend. Walk, walk in First reading is taken from James chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favouritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves, and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world, to be rich in faith, and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favouritism, you will sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. 
For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Our second reading is taken from Mark chapter 7 verses 24 to 37. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children all eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found her child lying on the bed, and the demon had gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hands on the man. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears then he spat and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Fatha, which means be opened. At this the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Chapter 2 of James's letter is said to record what Christians should do with their lives. His starting point is the same starting point where all Christians should begin with Jesus. And here at the beginning of our reading, James says that as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, we should not show favouritism. He gives some examples of how we might treat a rich person and a poor person differently, showing favour to one and discriminating against the other. He says that this is not God's way. The world, and that includes us, can fail to see God's glory in the humble birth and the shameful crucifixion of Jesus. James explains that to follow the world's way of honouring the rich and powerful is a failure of faith in our God a God who is supremely revealed in Jesus. Why is it wrong to judge a person by his or her appearance or economic status? Well, by honouring someone just because he or she dresses well, we are making appearances more important than character. James reminds us in our reading of what he refers to as the royal law found in Scripture. Love your neighbour as yourself and tells us that if we keep this one law, we are doing right, because all the other commandments spring from it. As a pattern for living our lives, James asks in verse 14, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? True faith transforms our conduct as well as our thoughts. If our lives remain the same, unchanged, can we really believe the truths we claim to believe? In verse 17, James concludes, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. What he is saying is that true faith always results in deeds. However, whatever the deeds, they do not justify us. Faith brings us salvation. Active obedience demonstrates that our faith is genuine. Actions can only mean one thing, giving. How do we look at giving? Or a more basic question is, what do we think giving is? I believe that giving is one side of a two-sided coin. One side is giving and the other side therefore must be receiving. So perhaps we have to acknowledge both sides of this coin so that we don't have a lopsided view of life. 
Giving and receiving are very much major factors in all our lives. When I was checking the concordance, I found that there were uh, recorded in the Bible over 700 entries for give and its der derivatives and only 200 or so for receive. We know from scripture that the Lord loves the generous giver and that can only be because the most generous of all givers is in fact God. The Bible starts with the story of creation and the first four words are in the beginning God. This tells us that everything we have comes from God, that wonderful, generous God. As church, we tend to think of giving in terms of what we put on the collection plate. We forget that money is man-made and not God-made. That's not to say that what we give financially is of no importance. It is very important. But God gives us life. He gives us skills and abilities. He gives us minds with which we can think and and hearts to feel emotions. We have our senses and what wonderful gifts they are. We could spend hours describing to each other what we have experienced through our senses. The wonderful sights we have seen in, in beautiful scenery or the delicate colours and forms of flowers and plants and animals and birds. Let me tell you about just one. Once Margaret and I went to a birthday celebration for one of our neighbours who was more than 90 years old. A daughter had arranged a lunch at her own home and a few friends and neighbours had been invited. It was a lovely occasion. In the kitchen was a wall mounted television screen and on the screen were showing some tiny blue tit chicks, eight of them. A parent bird appeared and began feeding the chicks and then burrowed down beneath the chicks and removed some droppings before flying off. This was repeated at regular intervals. What we were seeing were live pictures from inside a bird box that was attached to a tree in their garden. They had installed a miniature camera inside the box and had watched as the nest was prepared, the eggs laid, the chicks had been hatched and were now being fed preparing them for the time when they would fly the nest and begin their own adult lives. We can watch on our televisions wonderful nature programmes and forget that similar things are being enacted in our own gardens. What a wonderful God is our God. What an incredible imagination. Even today we continue to discover more about our planet and the universe that surrounds us. Did you see the incredible pictures of far off galaxies that even included pictures of black holes? The scientists, and maybe ourselves, were astounded at discovering these amazing happenings in deep space. Or is it that God chooses to reveal these things to us, and not a, not a case of us discovering them? After all, they were there all the time. God must indeed smile at times. Perhaps he, he even has a good old chuckle when he hears of the escapades and spoutings of some of our great thinkers and scientists as they seek the, orange of the origins of the universe. Can, can't they just read the Bible and realise, in the beginning, God? God created everything for mankind to enjoy. All of these great gifts were given out of love. The greatest gift of all, though, is surely Jesus. God looked at the mess that mankind was making through greed and selfishness and decided to do something about it. Ivor Reese, one of our former ministers at Bamford Chapel, used to tell a true story of a lifeboat crew that was based in South Wales. There was a terrible storm and the lifeboat was launched to go to the aid of a ship that was in grave danger of sinking because of the mountainous seas that it was incapable of sailing in. The man in charge of the lifeboat, the boatswain, had managed to get a line to the stricken ship and now, in spite of the danger involved, he needed to transfer one of his men onto the ship to supervise the transfer of the ship's crew to the lifeboat. That man would also be the last to leave the stricken ship, which was an even more dangerous task. The rescue was concluded successfully, and when back on trial land, the boatswain was interviewed, and he was asked who he had chosen to make the dangerous crossing to the ship and become the last man off it. He said that he had chosen his son, if it was so dangerous, he explained, how could he choose anyone else? God too had choices to make and he chose his son Jesus. Jesus was the one who would rescue stricken mankind no matter what. 
Jesus' ministry was also almost exclusively focused on the Jews and maybe this was symbolised by his appointment of 12 disciples to accompany him in his mission, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Our story from Mark tells us that Jesus had moved north to the vicinity of Tyre, where he might not have been as well known. But we are told a Greek woman who had a little daughter who was possessed by an evil, evil spirit heard that he was in the area and came and fell at his feet, begging Jesus to drive out the demon from her daughter. Mark does not disguise the harshness of Jesus' response as he insults her by his references to Gentiles being regarded by the Jews as dogs. For the sake of her daughter, the woman takes up the challenge and replies, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Jesus is impressed by her answer and grants her the healing for her daughter that she had asked for. These are wonderful examples of generosity in giving. God's gift to mankind of creation and of his son Jesus, and Jesus' gift of healing to the woman for her daughter. Gifts that were freely given out of love and with no charge to the recipients. God requires little of mankind for these his gifts. From the Jews, he asked for obedience and belief summed up in the two great commandments, to love God and to love their neighbour as they love themselves. Jesus also said that these two commandments were the greatest commandments and he added to them the word trust. John chapter 14 verse 1 reads, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. God gives and we receive. We don't have to repay God for these gifts, but as James reminds us, faith in God should cause a reaction in us to show our thanks in the way we act. Whatever your skills are, there is something that you can do. Volunteers are always being sought. There are things that take place during the day, and there are others that take place in the evenings. There are things that children can help with, and things, things also for adults. Do you like visiting people? There are others who need visiting and will appreciate someone calling. Lots of the things that take place require the backup of prayer support. You can pray for such as this anywhere. Are you a taxpayer and don't gift aid your, your money, contributions? Why not? The government also can be generous at times and allowing charities to claim back tax through gift aid is one of those occasions. Do you think that this is beyond you? We have all, I am sure, enjoyed the recent Olympics and now the uh, Paralympics Olympics have just begun. Disabled sport that now happens on a regular, regular basis reminded me of an ancient story about an elderly Chinese woman who had two large pots that she used to collect water, each hung on either end of a pole which she carried across her neck. One of the pots had a crack in it while the other pot was perfect and always delivered a full portion of water. At the end of the long walks from the stream to the house, the cracked pot arrived only half full. For a full two years this went on daily, with the, brummer, with the woman bringing home only one and a half pots of water. Of course, the perfect pot was proud of its accomplishment, but the poor cracked pot was ashamed of its own imperfection and was miserable that it could only do half of what it had been made to do. After two years of what it perceived to be a bitter failure, it spoke to the woman one day by the stream and said, I am ashamed of myself because this crack in my side causes water to leak out all the way back to your house. The woman smiled. Did you notice that there are flowers on your side of the path, but not on the other pot's side? That's because I have always known about your flaw. So I planted flower seeds on your side of the path, and every day while we walk back, you water them. For two years I have been able to pick these beautiful flowers to decorate my table. Without you being just the way you are, there would not be this beauty to grace the house. You see, if we are, if we are a little cracked, we can still bring colour and joy into our own and other people's lives. Smiles are free. Start giving them away and see how many you get back. Each of us has our own unique flaw, 
but it's the cracks and flaws we each have that make our lives together so very interesting and rewarding. You've just got to take each person for what they are and look for the good in them. The Paralympians and all the other athletes, athletes with disabilities have taken the seeming disadvantages that life has dealt them and developed and used them to produce great achievements for each of them personally and for their countries. To achieve this, they had to start somewhere and do something. Yes, each of us has something that we are good at, even if it is just being ourselves. Is that something we can offer for our own development and to the benefit of our church? Remembering that the church is the people and not the building. I must point out that we are not forced to do anything. James tells us that may, we, we may want to do something out of our own volition. Jesus tells us in John chapter 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you only do one thing then, do just as Jesus says and believe. There are no rewards for anything that you do for your church or for others except the feeling of, sat of satisfaction for doing something. The rewards for believing in Jesus is eternal life. If you can't think of anything else to do, please at least do this. Amen. And we sing again, and our hymn is Thine Be the Glory. We come now to our prayers for others. We pray for those whom the good news of Christ's resurrection at Easter is just too good to be true. For those who long to believe but are looking for proof that when none can be given, accept the eye of faith. We pray for those who will only accept what can be seen, touched or scientifically confirmed. For those who dare not believe because of the challenge to their whole way of thinking 
and the changes it would require them to make to their whole way of living. May the risen Christ touch their hearts with his grace. We pray for those who can go no further, for those who have lost confidence and courage, for those for whom hope is gone and joy has withered away, for those for whom life no longer holds any promise and each day is a burden too much to bear, for those who are ill, and we name, we name before the Lord those we hold in our hearts. We pray for those who are dying and for those who have the care of the sick and dying, for those whose lives are empty and with the passing years have lost meaning, for the lonely, for those that are alone and for those who are confused. May the risen Christ give them peace. We pray for the church and for all Christians, for those who live in the dark and fearful places in the world. We lift up those in Afghanistan too that that are fearful for their lives, for those in Haiti whose lives have been devastated once more by the violent earthquake and its aftermath, for those crushed with violence because of their faith, for those facing pain and evil intentions of others, for those who are living and worshipping as if Christ is not risen but is still in the tomb, for those who have never experienced the joy, the freedom and the power that raised Christ from the dead, for whom faith means hanging on by the skin of their teeth. We pray for those seeking answers to the meaning of life, solutions to their problems and assurance of God's real presence, but will not risk looking for them in the empty tomb. May the risen Christ transform their hearts. We pray for our world and for those filled with hatred and despair, for those who never smile, never laugh, never cry, for those who simply exist when God intended them to live. For those who seek instant pleasure rather than risk opening their lives to the power of Christ. For those whose lives are ruined as they clothe their existence with addictions that promise everything now for a moment. And for those who never hear God's offer of life in abundance and his promise of heaven because we do not tell them. May the risen Lord open blind eyes and sealed lips. We pray for someone we know who needs to know that they are forgiven, for someone who longs to be free, for someone who knows we know who, who is empty, for someone who is frightened, hurting or just on their own, for someone who wants to know that God is real and he is always with them, for someone at home, at school or a neighbour. May the risen Christ stay with them and bring his peace. We pray for ourselves. Lord, give us a new joy in your presence and a new awareness that you are alive. Give us the courage to name your name with our lives and our lips. Fill us, we pray, with your joy and your power, with your love and with your grace, with a trust in your dying and an experience of your rising, so that our lives will simply overflow for your glory. May we have the joy of leading someone to the foot of an empty cross to find their saviour and to the empty tomb to discover their Lord. We offer our prayers and speak our requests in the name of Jesus, the living Christ. Amen. And we come to our final hymn, which is, And Can It Be?
We close with our blessing. Go now with love in your hearts, light in your eyes and life in your souls. Go in the service of Christ to proclaim what he has done for you and share what he has given. To his glory. Amen. May God bless you in the coming week. And we'll close our service by singing the doxology as a grace. <laughs>